Welcome to our Be Fantastic Fellows and supporters. While we're waiting for people to trickle in the room, there's a question on the chat. Have you watched a film that made you think about the climate crisis? Share with us in the chat, please. Welcome, Vasanti. You have the sun in your face. Sorry, we can't hear you. Hello. Hi, hi, welcome. Hi. So we have a question in the chat while we wait for everybody. Mm -hmm. Have you watched a film that made you think about the climate crisis? And so please share a name with us. What did you say, repeat? Have you watched a film that made you think about the climate crisis? Uh -huh. I think all of them, no? No, this is just a question in the chat for us to share with each other. Anything other than the films we're going to watch right now? Okay, where is that question? Let me read it. Yeah, I'll look at it. Thank you. We also have a poll while we wait. Thank you, Surabhi. Can't open the chat. What is the reason? Uh, I think you should. You don't have it on the bottom of your screen. Yeah, it's you... there. It's some eight uh, eight uh, questions are there. Uh, yeah, you just need to double click on that. But okay, while Vasanti sorts that out. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody for the second dialogue in our dialogue series, uh, Tech Art and Climate. So we can move to the next slide, Kartika. Um, we're really, really happy and honored to have all of you here. Uh, today is, marks the last day of a primer session that we have hosted. Um, as part of Be Fantastic and Future Everything, uh, two organizations who've come together to host a fellowship that brings art and technology together, but also presents this, uh, this dialogue series as part of that. Uh, my name is Kamya. I'm the founder and director of Be Fantastic. We're a tech art platform and we were founded in Bangalore in 2017 under the incubation of Jaga. Um, really, we came together to amplify and bring together communities of artists and technologists to tell compelling stories. And this time, our curatorial thematic is climate, the climate crisis. Handing off to Irini, who is the creative director of Future Everything, who'll tell you a little bit about 
Hello, everyone. Welcome to the session, to the second dialogue. And uh, I'm Irini, the creative director of Future Everything. And we are an art, a non-profit arts organization based uh, in, in Manchester in the UK. And we've been um, working across uh, art technology and also exploring uh, societal issues. Uh, like we recently, we've been exploring quite a lot of work and in, in the context of uh, environmental crisis and climate crisis. And, uh, and of course, um, in thinking about bringing uh, these conversations and critical uh, dialogue in, uh, and, and art, of course, in, in the public space. So just uh, going beyond the, the gallery space. And we are looking forward to um, work with uh, Be Fantastic and Zaga in, on this project and looking forward to the dialogue today. Thank you all. So just very quickly to let you know that um, we have been running a fellowship with 25 really amazing fellows, a lot of whom are in the room today. Uh, welcome fellows and uh, thank you for your amazing energy over the last three weeks. Uh, they have been so motivated and engaged with the content of the fellowship and with coming together as collaborators. We've literally had to push them out for breaks uh, in these sessions. So Be Fantastic Within is the title of our fellowship and we've brought together artists, performing artists, uh, filmmakers and creative technologists from India, UK and Germany to explore AI technologies for creative practice. And Irini, back to you to talk a little bit about Future Fantastic. Yeah, thanks, Kamia. So yeah, so as Kamia said, we've got um, an amazing group of people from different backgrounds who've been exploring um, uh, the, the, these uh, themes uh, over the past like um, few, like three weeks. and. Uh, the the um, outcomes of the program will be presented uh, in, a, in a festival next year in Bangalore. Uh, the festival was, will be obviously uh, exploring these issues around artificial intelligence, uh, the, um, the, the challenges that come with it, but also the opportunities and of course in the context of climate change and environmental crisis. So, so we will be posting more about that as the program develops and uh, please keep um, keep in line and we will uh, yeah, hopefully have more announcements uh, to come through soon. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so please look forward and stay in touch uh, to uh, engaging with more such dialogue sessions as well as the final festival in March of 2023. And all of this is not possible without our partners and our supporters. Um, while Be Fantastic and Future Everything are doing the bulk of the work, we also have STEM Dance Company from Bangalore, who is supporting us with the performing art component of these programs. But big shout out to the British Council, um, who are one of our first funders for this, this year's program and the festival. And of course, Pro Helvetia, Swiss Arts Council, Pro Helvetia New Delhi, um, both the Brit, actually all three of our funders, Goethe Institute as well in Bangalore, all three of our funders have supported our previous fellowships as well. And um, year on year, this is our third annual fellowship. Year on year, we've kind of tweaked the program and we're really proud to say that these collaborative groups have come together and surprised themselves and us with the amazing projects that are being put forth. So. Thank you so much for your support and a shout out to Dara, our communication platform as well. With that, I want to introduce you to um, the schedule. We will have a film screening of three really critical films, Acoustic Ocean, Sub-Atlantic and Deep Weather by artist and digital essayist, Ursula Byman from Switzerland after which we'll have a short break. And then Ursula will join us with Vasanti Maria Das for a, a Q and A. We can move to the next slide. Um, I think before we get on, it would just be good for me to introduce you to both uh, Ursula and Vasanti. Um, 
So we're really, really happy to have with us Ursula Bayman. She's a Swiss video artist, curator, and art theorist. Her research-based practice traverses the lines between climate conscious documentary and science fiction. She's engaged with interwoven conversations around ecology, indigeneity, and geopolitics. And through her work, she navigates modes of perception that are often marginalized by the legacies of colonialism. Her writings have examined culture and politics at their intersections with various contemporary considerations from the implications of the Anthropocene to contextualizing of digital media. Her works have been exhibited internationally and she has won many awards, including the 2009 premiere at Oppenheim one, the Swiss Grand Art Award. And just a few days ago, she tells us, she was informed that she received the prestigious 2022 Zurich Art Award. We have uh, Vasanti Maria Das, who will be in conversation with Ursula about her work. Uh, Dr. Vasanti navigates between the worlds of film studies, critical theory, environmental humanities, and contemporary art. She did her MA and PhD in film studies and critical theory from Indiana University of Pennsylvania, US. She's She's the faculty re and researcher and the Dean for New Hum Humanities at Srishti Manipal Institute of Art, Design and Technology in Bangalore. Vasanti has collaborated over six years till 2019 with the Freiburg University, Offenburg University and the Indian Institute of Science and has jointly conceptualized a research project, Critical Zone, The Earth Below Our Feet. She has co-curated a retrospective and workshop on German filmmaker Harun Faruqi with the Goethe Institute Bangalore and facilitated a film workshop with Faruqi titled Labor in One Shot. Vasanti was also a Helena Rubinstein Fellow from the Whitney Independent Study Program, New York. And this she shares with Ursula, who's also one of the fellows. So welcome to Vasanti and Ursula, but uh, we will hear from them very shortly. So we will go into screening the three films and um, yeah, talk to you both after that. So Ursula, I would hand it off to you to um, tell us more about your work and Vasanti will respond as soon as she's back. Well, uh, first of all, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I'm unmuted, no? Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for this lovely invitation. It's a great pleasure to be in conversation with the fellows and with whomever joined the session here online. Um, we showed three films. Maybe I would start by saying that uh, the... Um, the, the oldest one is Deep Weather, um, which is the first one where I started to tackle the topic of climate change. And, um, and maybe later we'll discuss what this video is doing, um, uh, as opposed to the other ones. Hello, Vasanti. And then came Subatlantic which happened actually based on an invitation to a maritime exploration um, between artists and scientists that I was invited to. And then later, Acoustic Ocean, which is a 4K film, a much higher resolution, much more staged, and so on. So there is a kind of an evolution in these films that would make sense to address maybe um, as soon as Vasanti comes in and uh, lets us have her ideas on these things. And I give you over to you right now, okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I, I have converted my response to questions to a large extent and uh, I found, it, found them moving images, I must say. And uh, 
each piece was like a visual poetry. And um, as much as I was hesitant about admiring the beauty, beautiful earth, I, it also made me think about, it's not simply about the beautiful earth as such, but also about what we are doing to that and what's, uh, what are, what are our efforts as such to question about it and reflect about it? So in that sense, it was uh, amazing work. And uh, I found like scientists and particularly the critical zone scientists who collect samples from all over the world. You as an artist also uh, took visual uh, samples of water from around the world. And uh, you have traveled all over uh, to many parts of the world, Greenland, Norway, Shetland, uh, Canada, Caribbean, and Bangladesh, South American countries, etc. So uh, it's an amazing amount of work. Um, I just will start uh, part by part questions. And one part of it is the um, first film, um, Acoustic Ocean, and there I'm looking at uh, the setting. There's a kind of a setting of a stage almost over there for me, and um, uh, and and the, and I just was like wondering about a kind of a formal method that there's a kind of a stillness of the camera. There's a pause, and it's looking out, just like we would be there on a coastal region and look out into the ocean. And also, there's a kind of a depth you have for almost all your films, actually. Uh, but in this particular one, I, what I was like wondering about is you're foregrounding the rock and the scientist setting up her equipment. And then um, the ocean is at the back. And then there's a kind of a 360 degree kind of a rotation or revolution that happens. By the time you end the film, the water has come to be the for, in the foreground and the artist or the scientist is there on the other side uh, on the coast, continuing to work. I was just wondering if you would like to talk about that. And I think it sort of connects in some sense about some of the concepts of uh, what do you say, um, climate and environment and human um, interaction with the, with nature as such. Yeah, no, thank thank you, Asanti. That that's a, a good uh, observation. Um, so yeah, my work is about this human Earth interaction. And with acoustic ocean, I choose to address the interspecies communication um, because the Atlantic is not this silent kind of space. But by now we know that there is a lot of um, sonic uh, communication going on there that makes it very alive, very chatty, very talkative. Uh, but that, that we haven't had the instruments to listen to so far. So we, uh, we had a misconception about life in the oceans. And I clearly wanted to bring that to the foreground. And here too, I chose the figure of a, um, an indigenous scientist who will uh, do this interaction, which is scientific as well as more than scientific as well. Um, and because I went to the north, I was looking for a Sami um, indigenous person of northern Scandinavia, who is herself a performer and, I mean, an actress. She, she is an actress in kind of a Swedish um, television series, as well as a, a composer, mostly a composer, a musician, and a singer. And yes, it, these, these are these yokes that they sing, and she composed that very song herself, 
which relates to water is cleansing and so on. So it has its own kind of relation, sonic relationship with engaging with other species and the winds and the electricity in the atmosphere and so on. And, um, and I've used uh, sounds from an archive from all these different species that scientists have been recording since the 70s. It would actually be rather difficult today to make such recordings because, uh, because of the sonic pollution of the oceans. Um, but, uh, but here I created a fictional character. She's a marine biologist in my film. And I designed her kind of outfit and she brought her ethnic things along. So that's also a hybrid kind of appearance there. Um, um, and I also hired a, um, a, set, a set designer to create all these props so that she would have something to do. It's not enough just standing there on the rocks and singing out into the sea. I wanted her to really be there in acting things. And for that, it was best to have, to have props, um, these hydrophones and um, parabolic mics that go into the atmosphere and so on. So I think um, that whole setting is, is a very kind of um, theatrical, uh, setting in a way, um, which is also completely new in my practice, because so far in, in the other films and all my other films in the past, um, I'm working mostly with documentary material and with interviews a lot. You know, a lot of information comes through interviews. Um, but I was also getting tired a bit. I was trying to force myself to create works that have no interviews in them uh, and even force myself to make films where I don't have my own voice in there either, which is a very essayistic uh, a kind of a label, no? to have the authorial voice, um, not explaining to the viewers, but really doing something different, more like a, a theoretical um, meandering around the topic, kind of thinking in loops and coming back and putting it into other words and so on. So, so that's what I came up with. Um, uh, Acoustic Ocean is the result of the other two films, of course. For me, it was also really interesting that you called her the Aquanaut. The Aquanaut, yeah. yeah. And um, so, you know, in a way, um, it really brought things together in some sense because it, the immediate thought is the astronaut. And, uh, you know, the disproportionate exponential spend expenditure ma many countries do on the astronauts and uh, um, not so much on, or not at all on the CERT, but, you know, using the resources to do all that over there. And like uh, Latour would say, like, you're putting all this stuff there where nothing you're going to get. You're not going to get anything from that space over there. And, uh, and even the suit, I mean, suddenly it was really interesting to see. Uh, it resembles the deep diving suits that you use to go very deep under the water and the one that goes into the space as such. And then, I mean, uh, yeah, there's a little look in, in the way they look, they may be different, but they are really, you know, resonating that way. So I, I was, yeah, I like, I like that. Um, but, yeah, I wanted to um, make it even more resemble the um, astronaut because yeah. uh, I had designed, the set designer also created an immersible, you know, these glass capsules that go deep into the trenches, like mm -hmm. thousands of meters down. Mm -hmm. um, and he created this uh, funny vehicle but it was impossible to use because the winds are too strong there. So it would have blown away and so on. Um, but I had in mind that the, the aquanaut is kind of connected through these, um, these the depression valves that they have on the body to the, you know, for the depression uh, of the, the yeah, um, 
to be connected to the immersible mm -hmm. and also to the land somehow. And then, well, that didn't work. So I used a tent to mm -hmm. have her a bit of a base in, in the land. It needed something to be based, to be, to be docked to, you know. Mm -hmm. I was just also wondering, I mean, uh, how would you like to kind of uh, sort of suggest others who would like to work with science and um, and art together on the humanities and uh, science as such, because for environmental studies, it's increasingly important to do that. Uh, however, while we are immersing in that kind of study, I also notice a kind of an um, exasperation or a kind of uh, frustration too, but because you are specialized in your own field to quite a extent, and then when you go and uh, you know find want to find resources and not resources particularly to know and understand uh, the scientific aspects of many things to kind of uh, make a connection. Um, how far and uh, how much, or I'm not sure, I mean, it's simply a question how to kind of uh, do this engagement more uh, productively in some sense. I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Uh -huh. uh, in terms of you, 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 you mean in terms of research that I do preliminary to the going into the field or kind of connecting scientific things that relate to natural science, mm -hmm. to the humanities and the arts? I mean, yeah. that is really a tour de force, you know? I mean, this is what was the biggest challenge for yeah, me. That's what, um... Yeah, I mean, uh, because before going into environmental topics, mm -hmm. I was really focusing a lot more on gender and migration, on borders, on post-colonial labor. All these topics have been um, treated in the humanities. There are loads of theories. It relates very much to post-colonial and gender studies, mm -hmm. which is more like cultural studies. Now with the environment, you, I suddenly found myself in an area that I knew nothing about, not in terms of uh, facts and data, but also in, uh, in terms of the strategies I could use as an artist to address it. Mm. You know? and, uh, and that was, that took me almost two years of reading into the subject matter and I mean, now you have environmental humanity centers uh, in, in many of the universities, even the University of Zurich has such a thing. That was, of course, completely unknown at the time, you know? And um, so, yeah, I mean, the sources, I think that um, science journalists have been a very important source for me because they have this really good way of explaining things to a larger mm -hmm. audience uh, in, in a language that was more familiar to the kind of reading I did before, you know. So that was helpful. Um, but, but really uh, entering this, this um, critique of the Anthropocene was entering first of all, into a completely different time dimension. Suddenly, you know, I mean, we've been thinking and speaking and writing a lot about the, the time since the Second World War. <laughs> that was such a preoccupation of, of in my culture. Um, and now suddenly it was blown open and we are speaking about the last 12,000 years. I mean, how, how can you grapple with such a huge shift in thinking. And uh, so in Subatlantic, I created this character, a fictional narrated figure only. She doesn't appear in person, but one that could kind of uh, bridge this huge time scale. Obviously she has been there 12,000 years ago at the at last, ice melt 
uh, where she saw the oceans rising for a thousand years. And say people had to evacuate and her instruments need to be replaced and so on and so forth. And she's arriving today in this time where we encounter very similar situation. We have a an ice melt and this will greatly transform the topography of earth. And so I thought it would be interesting to create a figure that speaks kind of from the sub-Atlantic, from underneath the Atlantic, speaking up to us, you know, a kind of um, up to us in the present. Um, and so, of course, for such an idea, you have to create a fiction, a fictional figure that's an, 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 no real person can can manage this um, this kind of uh, um, gap. So that's how this video came about. And based on this idea, I thought it would be interesting to actually create a figure and have it performed. It would be more impressive to have a real figure there and have it performed. And that's how I decided to, to, to start with Acoustic Ocean. So there's a direct connection between the two videos where Sub-Atlantic is kind of the precursor to acoustic ocean. Do you want to kind of also maybe explain the term Sub-Atlantic because it seems to have at least two meanings when you are in your work. Um, the Atlantic, the Sub-Atlantic. Yeah, sub yeah, because there is this Holocene uh, preceded by the subatlantic or something i'm not sure yes so you have you have the um the climatic area uh, eras uh which is not the anthropocene and the, uh, the holocene and so on but you have the the, the climatic areas a subatlantic is is a particular period um which started I don't remember, now you catch me. I mean, this is uh, quite a long time ago that I made this film, but we are still in the, in the era of the sub-Atlantic. Sub um, and, uh, and at the same time, of course, it's also speaking about all the facts that are happening uh, in the submerged field of the Atlantic. So it's a it's a climatic era that is like a um, it's it's like a geological time, mm -hmm. and and then it's the, a location as well, where all these kind of dynamics are happening. Um, in the in deep weather, uh, it begins or it the voiceover is always whispering. Um, but, uh, could you just talk about that? It was interesting. Um, so deep weather. Yeah, deep weather. Um, so speaks about the connection of these two locations, the uh, Alberta Tar Sands and the Bengal Delta. Mm -hmm. uh, and how they relate to one another as a result of a change in the atmospheric chemistry. So I felt a lot of activation has to go into this chemistry of the, um, the atmosphere. The atmosphere is actually the place where things happen here. And, um, and so, I don't know, I was just experimenting with voice and felt I wanted to create a kind of a very insisting, very powerful kind of uh, insisting voice that doesn't kind of shout out, but you have to listen well to get it, yeah? Yeah. to pay more attention to what I'm saying. So, And also the uh, very first shot of deep weather, uh, you show those containers. And uh, those containers are like, you know, in the foreground again, again. Um, and after that, they don't come up very much. Um, I was reminded of Alan Sekula's work, Forgotten Space. And um, um, yeah, I mean, in a way, 
I mean, the way I'm looking at it um, is these containers have really become so big. And uh, in fact, the ships have also grown along with it. And um, therefore, he calls it the floating islands as such. And, um, and, and, and also, I mean, uh, I'm also thinking about the displacement of water that happens when such huge kind of, you know, um, ships and uh, containers are entering the ocean and uh, plowing through it. And also, and so it connects in two ways. And one is the, um, the displacement of the water will be elsewhere. Um, and, and uh, yeah, like places like Bangladesh and so on get affected by them. Uh, in the long uh, thing, and the, and also the other kind, other thing about it is, um, um, you you are talking about the temperature rise and the Himalayan uh, melting and so on. Um, so the, this the the work uh, the work is like uh, you know uh, talking about um, these interferences and therefore these are again other interferences to, to kind of uh, uh, block the communication among the whales and those uh, bottom creatures as, uh, at the base of its sub-Atlantic as such, if you want to call it. And um, I'm just wondering about, um, a minute, um, um, there is a film by Saurav Sarangi. It is a, he's a filmmaker from Bangladesh who also made uh, on this uh, floods and uh, how these um, islands keep shifting. And they're like, uh, you know, just floating. They're not anchored very much. And every year they shift around. Uh, to the point, um, you know, as you call it, uh, terrorist, I mean, it's kind of a um, citizenship on water. Um, but here, uh, he's also, I mean, the border across um, Bangladesh and India also goes across these floating islands, basically. And I'm not sure what happens to them then. But also, you have the, um, he talks about, uh, if, if, if when the wa wa water keeps going and cutting down at the side, he's a geologist. So basically he shows how the water is working to kind of separate these things and make them float and change and move around. In the process, people are like um, really without any, without citizenship sometimes, without home, first of all, and without any uh, kind of, um, uh, means to live as well, and many turn to smuggling, and the border control around that area can get very harsh and very difficult for them. I mean, as it is, they are struggling, and then this happens to the people around there as such. Yeah, so it's, it's called Char No Man's Island, Saurav Sarangi. I just wanted to get that reference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, floods, uh, there are also always a lot of victims with floods. Uh, Bangladesh, um, I mean, I was interested in, in uh, finding a place where I can research water water problems. What, water was the, my, my first intention to work on as, a, as an environmental issue. And Bangladesh has just about every water problem that you can imagine between uh, toxic, uh, toxic things and too much water, not enough and moving around and everything, everything happens there. Um, but the attitude behind this film is not to show, not to show victims, of course, it is to show how, how social communities are taking measures, intelligent, very efficient measures um, to, you know, to, to protect their villages in, in these very amphibian places because, um, uh, I mean, they are just outside of the national kind of security areas that are created by big embankments. These, 
Bangladeshi are so desperate to find land to settle on that they go way outside of these areas and um, take risks. Um, and, and these measures are to create a minimum of security. Um, and in the summer, a lot of these um, communities are actually fixing the embankments or creating new ones like the one in the film. And it was extremely difficult to find a taxi driver who would take me out in such areas. And it took two full days to travel out there. So it's extremely remote, very difficult terrain. Um, but I had read in an NGO report that actually these women are fixing the embankments. And I just imagined this image. And I said, that's exactly what I need to film. And of all the footage that I took during the two and a half weeks of Bangladesh, it's this footage that I wanted to use, you know. Um, and so it's about creating these, um, uh, you know, conveying these uncertainties of the terrain, which, because they're not steady, they're no longer sturdy, they move, they move around, they're fluid. Um, that was an interesting idea for me. And then, uh, and then these alarm systems. And I mean, that's the kind of research I did on location to, to, you know, to convey information that is not already uh, known to everyone by just reading the newspaper. So, but this in itself actually did not add up to a film. I came back from Bangladesh and I, just this embankment video is just not making an artwork. And it's only a year later when I got an invitation to speak in Alberta um, because due to an older video that I did on the oil pipeline in Azerbaijan, that um, they invited me to come up to the tar sands if I wanted to. They invited me for a few days to visit. And that's when I knew now I have a, a project to connect Alberta tar sands with this footage, this will make a project for me, you know. Yeah, about the land though, because they are losing land most of the time. Uh, in that film, they also talk about, um, if you ask them, they still look, at, uh, they point out, point to the water that that is their land as such, you yeah? And, um, but in your film, I noticed um, some of your long shots, particularly. Um, a kind of, a, it became like they are the extension of the embankment as such. Um, maybe because those sacks were also white and many of them were wearing white shirts and this uh, hanging of the thing. But the human embankment, it became almost, mm. you know. Uh, some of your shots seem to convey that kind of an image, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll also, I, I liked your link. Of, I mean, this is going back to the first film. Um, link when you make um, to military. So when you are talking about the, uh, when you are talking about the, uh, sound, which they did not know, and they were not ready to know, it looks like, uh, those whales were making the, those, uh, that sound. Uh, indeed, and only later, because then the necessity came, I guess, to be able to hear it, you know, the hearing itself is like, um, a facilitated with your necessity or human necessity as such and so on. So I I thought that I, I, I was thinking about that connection as well. Are you speaking about acoustic ocean here or what? Yeah, yeah the first film, acoustic ocean. Uh -huh. Where the military had, uh, because they wanted to know if, the, if enemy submarines are around. And so there were like all these sound detective spy Recording. Yeah, it's a Cold War technology mm. that has when after the uh, the end of the Cold War, 1991, 
Mm. Uh, it was opened to a larger public and to uh, science. Mm. Uh, they were invited to use these aggregations of, uh, of uh, uh, it, these military installation at the sea bottom mm. to uh, listen in, uh, this time not on other submarines, but on, on the, the animals. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's how they found the whale songs, you know, that's how, that's how they uh, discovered mm -hmm. the whale songs. Um, and that's an, a very beautiful thing that military equipment can be repurposed for this kind mm -hmm. of species communication and to create this sonic, uh, very meaningful sonic uh, field of communication. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I always try to also show the, the positive side of things. I mean, I've been interested in geopolitics for a long time, and there is a lot of critical stuff that could be voiced, you know, when you start getting into these researches. But, I mean, that's... Um, then what do you do? You just said what's, what's going uh, wrong. But I think our purpose as artists is also to... Uh, make propositions to to be propositional in our intentions, so that uh, it shows ways forward and and re re words things, so it can become something useful for us, um, rather than uh, just creating negative feelings. So, yeah, and I think that's where my voice comes in very often because I'm saying. I'm saying something in a very gentle, lovely way, but actually what I'm saying is often really horrific, but I think it goes down better <laughs> if, you if you create a more pleasant condition of listening, you know? Oh, so yeah. yeah you can but I think I've been saying a lot of things. It would be wonderful if you could open the floor and hear some of the voices little squares up there yeah perfect swiss timing ursula <laughs> uh, that is timing yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, that's exactly what we're supposed to do <laughs> it's intuitive for us swiss. <laughs> thank you so much for that uh for folks in the room please shoot your questions i know we have a few questions in the chat but if you'd like to be more verbal and so the squares can come alive, please put up your raised hand feature on your um, the bottom of your screen and we'll take questions as they come. Go for it, Malvika. Unmute, Malvika. Uh, yeah, I'll go straight to the question. There's a lot of us and I'm sure everyone is curious to ask you things. Um, there's a detail that uh, that uh, that was there in um, Acoustic Ocean, I think, where you spoke about the Arctic being the place where where you could hear the sounds of the underwater ocean, or there's some sort of like sound portal where they come out of and you can hear them. Have I understood this correctly, or could you talk about it a little bit more, please? I didn't fully get that. Could you could you say that again, Malavita? In, in Acoustic Ocean, I think if that's the right film, there was a portion where you were speaking about the Arctic, Arctic Circle being the space where the sound from the undercurrents of the ocean emerging. Comes up. Yeah. 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 Can you talk about that, please? Yeah, that's, uh, I think that has to do with, um, we think water is the same everywhere, but that's not true at all. It, it comes in layers. And these layers have different pressures and different yeah. matters as well, different chemical constitutions. And sound travels within these layers. And for some reason, I think towards the Arctic poles, they tend to come up. These layers are come up to the surface. And I don't know if, I, I don't remember exactly the explanation for that, but that's where you suddenly hear things that have been traveling a lot through these layers from the oceans. I think the Arctic, the, generally the Earth spins slower among the poles, right? That's the idea that the disks are, are, are spinning much slower. So it might have something to do with the fact that they have less, less distance to travel 
in the yeah. that they are spinning i don't know it just it, it's yeah. a very it's a very beautiful idea that the sound of water kind of spouts out on the poles mm -hmm. yeah it's a sound that happens such images really captivate my my interest i i gather them together i think the wordings and the ideas to bring in connection with such images is really what makes a, a powerful kind of communication of of a more sensorial kind you know not just uh, a mental understanding of the facts because many of the things i'm saying in this film uh, is, is stuff that we learn in high schools. It's not such <laughs> amazing new data that I'm going to surprise you with, you know? Um, so I think the exercise is a different one. Um, and also maybe to remind us uh, of certain, uh, you know, like the, 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 the ocean streams slowing down. That's really a huge catastrophe coming our way, you know, uh, and just to kind of remind us how this actually works um, is something I feel committed to, you know. Thank you, Malvika. Uh, John? Hello there. Um, we've talked an awful lot about the journey into making a film. What role does the audience have in the film, and do how much do you control how the film is seen? Do you know, like David Lynch gets furious about people watching his films on their mobile phones, for instance. Uh, do, does the artistic process continue how you curate the way the film is seen? If that makes sense. Um, yeah, I mean, acoustic. Oh, I mean, I uh, I have to say that I'm quite flabbergasted at the quality of the films um, streamed online like that, where like uh, seventy percent of the quality is just lost from the start. Um, and they are very sonic. They're very they're sound projects as well. So acoustic ocean is installed usually in a projection about six meters wide at least. Uh, all of these films are about landscapes. So they go all the way down to the floor, to the walls, to up to the ceiling. I create entire walls, not just a picture on the wall somewhere, you know, uh, so that the viewer is completely immersed. Plus um, there is the walls are painted in a dark blue with the hydrophones hanging from the ceiling. And another video that is actually looking a bit like, uh, has the shape of a pothole, uh, where a, a film is, is uh, projected that is from under the water, uh, looking up to the surface of the ocean. So I think I create an exhibition space that is uh, creating the atmosphere of an underwater place. And then it has, it's a 5.1 sound system there. So what you, what you see is just an idea of getting, um, of, of the content of, uh, you know, um, but the, the experience is a very different one when you see it installed. But I think for education purposes, for little lectures, it's, it's okay. It's okay, I'm not, uh, not so picky. <laughs> Great Thank you so much. On. Bruce, you had a question about artists and using science as metaphors. Would you like to elaborate on that? Yeah, um, just thinking about this, the speculative nature of it, really. <clears throat> if a, um, when an artist re relates to the tools and techniques and methods of science, you know, quite often it's speculative, right? You know, it's, there's, there's, it's open to interpretation. There's a kind of poetic dimension to it, which is um, uh, <clears throat> unlike when a scientist is doing science, you know, it has to be kind of rigorous and direct and uh, un unambiguous. Whereas the, the, for an artist, actually cultivating ambiguity or inviting it in can sometimes be a good thing because it kind of challenges um, kind of meta narratives or something, you know, that, that kind of thing, you know, where you can actually, you can, as, a, as an audience or a, a spectator, a viewer, whatever, there's room for your participation in terms of how you <clears throat> imagine the thing, 
in your own mind? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, with the figure of the indigenous scientist, um, I'm basically trying to not just add new, new, uh, new layer of science to it. So, but, but to um, to question and undermine a little bit the, the 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 rational way that science pursues, because I think that is part that has really been part of the problem in the last two hundred years that has shaped greatly our relationship to Earth, you know. And, uh, and I think it's, uh, that's what art can do, kind of interfere in this almighty rationality of science, um, which really hasn't produced that many solutions rather than also rather lots more problems as well as we see now. Um, and to uh, make us uh, think along different lines, you know, or to open up. I think I'm pleading for greater epistemic diversity, really, more diversity in thinking. Uh, and so in that sense, um, my scientific figures is, is, but I have been inspired by indigenous scientists who actually do uh, science, you know, forensic chemists, uh, soil samples. Um, I've also along the entire Nile Valley, I've taken Nile water samples in all these different Places analyze them for their, you know, chemical and physical uh, things. So, so I've done more empirical things as well, but I don't think ultimately that's that's in, that's what art is best at. <laughs> hmm. Thank you, Sula. Thank you, Bruce. Do we have anybody else? I have one more question. Could we let you go and then? Uh... Can I? May I? Yeah. Um, in... Oh, and... sorry, 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 sorry. I didn't hear that. I'm sorry, sorry. No problem. Yes, I, I, um, I think I think this um, the acoustic aspect is very important of the water, and um, when we think about underwater sound pollution massive one also the, the coming deep sea mining so i'm really concerned about this and i think that the awareness to that should be much more you know we have to contribute i don't know how artists can do but you are showing a way how can we open a window of well of awareness is easier as of hope you know the call for action for hope because this uh, will be, yeah, there are big plans of, of um, exploitation of the resources underwater. And nobody's speaking about the consequences. I don't, yeah. don't really so much hear about it. There's a lot of art now and exhibitions and conferences that relate to the oceans and antisonic um, pollution actually comes up quite a lot. Because yes. as seen as, as one of the big big problems, um, because the whale the whales, for instance, of course, they communicate along along very long distance between themselves, and um, this interferes enormously. Um, and dolphins too. I mean, their their ear um, their ears are popping. You know, they bleed out of the ears because they. Oh so overwhelmed with the sonar uh, sonar waves there that they use for exploration first and then for mining. But the transportation as well, that's a really. And the military also, military also. Yeah. yeah. Marvika, go ahead. Yeah. Um, again, this is regarding uh, acoustic ocean um, and just, just an observation regarding deep weather. Uh, in, in acoustic ocean, you are putting these uh, mics and speakers into the ocean. Is that what those hydrophones are? 
Yeah, that's, um, these are modeled uh, after real hydrophones that people uh, are using to do deep sea recordings. But of course they go out on deep on big ships and do and let these hydrophones go down and then do the recording. I just didn't want to make a film with ship footage. I didn't, I was not interested in, in having that kind of aesthetics. And so, um, and so I wanted to, what, what we did was uh, creating these, these preparations in a way on shore um, and then suggest that these are for uh, deep sea listening, you know. And then she's having, she, she has this kind of mixing desk, like an animal yeah. Radio station there that she's mixing and so on. So, <laughs> and there is there is that uh, portion also that where you're talking about the sort of communications that you're sending out, and she's waiting for a response of some kind. Is there a call yeah. to the response? Is waiting, waiting to hear something back. Exactly. So does the, that mean you're sending out a sonic message as well into the water, or is that uh, metaphoric? It's met. I mean, it's it's a uh, it's metaphoric. It's a uh, um, I'm not sure. I don't think they send out sounds when they do the real deep, deep sea um, recording. I I don't think she's doing that. But you can read into her action whatever you like. You know, I mean, the idea is interspecies communication, and I think it's the willingness to listen uh, and to expect a response. Um, that that is what I what I'm getting at, you know. No, no, I understand that. I'm understanding the act of the willingness of listening. Okay. Uh, but if it's communication, then uh, as a human, as the human representative, what what might she be communicating other than, hey, I'm here, I'm listening to you, or is that enough for a conversation to begin? Is that what you're saying? Well, she's singing. She's singing to the sea and to the wind and to the atmosphere. And I think that's what uh, Sami do. Uh, they communicate with the winds. Um, it's not deep sea creatures this time. I think we have no language to communicate with them. But um, we have means of recording their presence and what they do and for what these are. So... Um, and also, you know, they, I mean, I've read, I also spoke with some, with some um, specialists in the south of England, actually in Exeter, there's at the university, there are people doing a lot of fish investigation. Uh, and it, it, apparently they even speak, um, they speak in dialects and with the climate change, um, uh, fish are moving further north, for instance, on the coast of, of America, you know, further east of the um, of New England, certain animals move constantly further north uh, and meet with other fish that speak a different dialect. And they don't even communicate well with each other. They're worried that they won't mate because they don't communicate properly. Um, so I think a lot, a lot of new problems <laughs> emerge, you know, um, also the level of communication, not just physical survival. Yeah. Sometimes these, these things are really, are really interesting. And sometimes I'm packing those information into my texts. I think that my writing is always a complement to the, 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 the video works that I do. Not all, I mean, you see, I'm, I'm, I'm using poetry also to be super efficient. I think yeah. I don't want to use more words as absolutely necessary to convey certain ideas. But in the texts that I publish, I can pack a lot more information in and make other kind of um, uh, reflections. So I think this goes hand in hand somehow. Thank you, Malvika, and thanks, Ursula. We have Ursula. Um, hi, so my question was about the film Subatlantic um, and you mentioned in it that, you know, how uh, as the ice is melting, 
न्यू एंड न्यू बायो मटीरियल लाइक जीन मटीरियल इज बी इंट्रोड्यूस टू दी ओशन सो फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल दैट वॉज अ वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग पॉइंट फॉर मी आई नेवर कंसिडर बट वॉट काइंड ऑफ इफेक्ट इफ एनी डज इट हैव बिकॉज आई फील लाइक मोर एंड मोर न्यू जीन मटीरियल न्यू एज एन समथिंग दैट वॉज ओल्ड but new right now will be introduced into the ocean ecosystem now right so what kind of effect might it have yeah i mean we have we have yet to see these these carry uh new genetic materials but microbes um, you know bacteria viruses could be all sorts of things that we humans are not prepared for um and all the animals right. either so um there is a transformation there that is um, i mean what i'm what i'm saying there also that it creates more uncertainty maybe some anxiety also about this transforming planet where we don't exactly understand what is coming our way a lot of changes are very subtle very invisible very uh, on a on a microscopic level but it adds up and suddenly new pandemics can emerge and so on you so yeah. now know that uh, these things can can have a massive impact uh, but i'm what i'm trying to do with uh, sub atlantic is also to uh, to mingle feelings thoughts and so on with material transformation that 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 ideas and thoughts and anxieties and feelings have a physical presence in our landscapes and that ha- they have to be taken just as important as it, as as uh, as material things and processes that's what i'm i'm doing there um that's why i'm I really, yeah i really appreciate the way this thought is presented in the film as, as well visually mm-hmm. with the um, pieces of ice uh, sort of floating on water i think you can almost imagine the surface getting slowly melted and new organisms coming to live with us thank you I mean, that sabelandi that's from 2015 that's seven years ago i was in the field even before of course to make the film was 2014 I mean that's probably I would not go for an ice melting video today you know I think that time is over when you can use such metaphors um mm. and also deep weather is even 2 years before that uh and there climate change was just not making headlines in the in the newspapers it was just uh, some kind of phenomena that, that that was not taken very seriously um and so i felt uh, i needed to start with a very simple concept i need to say ah wow two very far away locations can be connected because of this climate change thing you know uh where i started with a very simple concept for a film and then became more and more complex i mean lately as you know i'm i'm working on forests not so much on the climate issues um but these these three films that you saw they they represent three different approaches to three different strategies of how one can uh tackle this this huge problem by creating a small comments in a way and by reformulating things um, visually you know so um thank you ursula and it is i am aware that you had a question early on about recording equipment is that still a question for you not necessarily i think that um i think we cover most of it um okay. yeah i mean i guess we cannot get really too much in detail on, on the technical aspects of of of, of the recordings uh, on the sea but uh, Yeah if there's any like reference say uh, perhaps that I could take a look uh, or or something like that I mean personally we didn't do any under on the water recordings uh because these uh, enormous hydrophones they are like industrial size hydrophones these are just props they're hollow they don't have a they don't have a recording 
technology inside, you know? Oh. So, yeah. yeah. I, for the performance, I didn't need to, to buy uh, eight huge uh, underwater microphones, you know? Um, but I'm sure if, if I could research them, you can as well. I know there. For Sub Atlantic, I just used, uh, I just bought a, a small, um, what is it called? Cybershot, uh, a little Sony, uh, is it, oh, a little Canon Cybershot that you can use for underwater. It's like $300. And um, because I knew I, I wanted to also film under the ice. Um, and I just, uh, I just went out with a fisherman and we, we tied the, the camera to the fishing pole and just held it down. So I had no idea what I was filming. Um, I only saw it back home when I looked at the files. Um, but uh, the, the footage is okay, you know, I just, I don't think people look at my films because they think it's a, it's a kind of a camera masterpiece. Although I think acoustic ocean, in acoustic ocean for the first time, I hired a camera woman to come along because I was just getting um, tired of, of, of having to train myself every time new models come out and, you know, buying a 4K camera, I, I might as well just hire a woman who, do, who does it for me. So, um, and since then, I'm really, I'm really fond of this, uh, of this new arrangement. <laughs> yeah, of course. It, I just have like a follow up questions, if, if that's okay. Uh, it's more about the par parabolic microphone. There were some sounds that is kind of like, sounded a bit like like pieces of ice falling down or something like that. Um, I don't know if you kind of identified the sounds that you were capturing when you were using that. Um, in Acoustic Ocean? while she's doing the 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 parabolic yeah uh, there actually i i looked for i looked for sounds online uh, that had this kind of el electricity in the air which is part of the polar atmospheric system you know because they have these polar lights but also they have a lot of um crackling sounds in the air that's what I was uh, after, but I, you know, I can find these online. It's not a big deal. Um, but now I have a sound, a sonic, um, a sound designer, who um, who does a lot of work for me. So, uh, yeah. But um, yeah. Thank you. Is and we have time for one last question, Jones. I see your hand up. Thank you, Kamya. Uh, so I want to go to Acoustic Ocean and like the figure of like the Sami uh, scientist, the indigenous scientist. And uh, I mean, like the Sami is also like a community which is like marginalized in like the geographic that we are there in and like their culture is pretty much kind of like pushed and like out of the mainstream. And there's this, in during the COP26 summit this time, there's this like statement made by the Alaskan activist, Ruth Miller, that I've been going back to quite frequently, which is to accept uh, indigenous knowledge and sciences as being equal to Western knowledge and sciences. And again, with like your current project, you know, uh, the, you know, like, how do you, uh, you know, Sadar Devanya, like you're also like kind of like, talking about like indigenous knowledge systems. And I was just wondering if you could like comment a little bit about your engagement with this space of like uh, knowledge and culture and com yeah. Um, this is very hard. Now we have three more minutes and you ask a question where I could really speak for a long time because all of my current projects are a bit like that well you know it's it's such a colonialism ha, has been re, has really affected education so much um, that to 
to rethink knowledge production in the indigenous context, uh, I just find this a very important thing to do um, because they, you know, their culture has not been valorized and, and um, um, yeah, I mean, all these things, you know, I, I, I don't really know what to tell you now about, about this. Because with the Sami, I have not really researched uh, that aspect because I wanted to make something very different. Um, now in the Latin American, in the South American and Amazonian context, um, it's a completely different story. And, um, and that cannot be told in two minutes, really, <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, we'll have you in for another session, Ursula. <laughs> Do a forest session, yeah, at some point. I guess it was very unfair of me to pop that in, in the last second, last two minutes. Vinny, instead of thanking in the chat, can I have you verbalize what you've just written? Yes, please. Irini. Uh, <laughs> ah, sorry. <laughs> yes, just to say a big, big thank you to both of you. And thank you, uh, Ursula, for sharing your amazing uh, work. I'm sorry for the background. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it, it's been such, uh, such a great, uh, I thought it was such a great treat to see that after all this um, intense like fellowship program and which kind of stage one came to an end today so so this is uh giving so much food for thought uh for the for, for what's coming next so so thank you again for for doing that and for being here with us and uh yeah big thanks to you Vasanti as well for your amazing comments and yeah questions as well and uh yeah thank you both thank you everyone thank you I'm really thrilled we had this conversation Yes, and as usual, there are a lot of questions still burning, but I think that's the intent of some of these sessions that we leave unfulfilled in a weird way so that we can keep that curiosity going. So thank you everybody for your questions and contributing your energy to this discussion. And um, Ursula, Vasanti, I hope we keep this chat going somehow, somewhere. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Vasanti, as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ursula.